from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Well, hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Wow Report, where we count down the top 10 things that make us go wow. wow. <laughs> um, we're continuing to enjoy our time in isolation. I'm Fenton Bailey. That's Go overstating on. it a bit. Um, what? That's overstating it a bit. Enjoying is this a bit of an overstatement. I just like one day because it really is bizarre to like track <laughs> one day of the week or the calendar or just the <laughs> time of day. It's and like, suddenly, all of a sudden, I find myself at two in the morning. I'm like wide awake, and then four in the morning, I'm like I've got to go to sleep at some point. And it's just every day is bleeding. Day is bleeding into night. Night is bleeding into day. Weeks are bleeding into months. I don't know. What's going on? Yeah. Tom, what do you think? I, I think we should introduce ourselves. <laughs> oh, right, right. Well, you would really need no introduction at this point. You are Tom Campbell, a chief creative officer at World of Wonder, and joined by James St. James, the what do you call what is the word for the insomniac? That's right. The insomniac uh, that's it. The insomniac, the insomniacal. <laughs> 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 and, and we're gradually losing the ability to speak and form sentences. Oh. <laughs> An incoherent mumble of yeah, primordial word sludge. <laughs> uh, okay, well, should we count down the top 10 things that made us go wow this week? Let's do. Okay, Tom, what have you got at number 10? Number 10. Well, normally the WOW report comes from uh, World of Wonder headquarters in the heart of Hollywood and Hollywood Boulevard, but now that we're in different places, I'm coming to you from our West Hollywood office, and my first story is about a West Hollywood institution that is no more, and that is the Circus of Books, which uh, the the uh, it's been turned into a documentary, the story of Circus of Books. It's going to premiere on Netflix in April 22nd or something. So for anyone who's gay or gay curious, You've got to watch this documentary. Um, I have not seen it. I've only seen the trailer. Did you see it at the uh, Tribeca? Um, yeah. Fenton? I've seen it. Um, uh, you know, in, in one of those, like, you know how in life opportunities are presented to you and you just blow them off or you miss them? So the lovely Rachel Mason came to us with this documentary years ago and said, will you executive produce it? And we were like, uh, I don't know. It was a busy time, I'm sure. She went and got Ryan Murphy to executive. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, and uh, it's just been, it's been a Tribeca, it's been a festivals. It's, it's, uh, it's, it actually is fantastic. It's about her parents. Yeah. The backstory is, is that in like night in the 19th, um, the one in Santa Monica, there's, there used to be one in Silver Lake, but the one that's I think being most featured is the one that's on Santa Monica Boulevard. The building is still there. And I believe it's been, it's going to Chichi LaRue. I was just going to say, yes, it is. It's opening up, up under new new management, and it's the porn producer, legendary drag person, Chichi LaRue, who bought it and is re remaking it. And you can't, I mean, for those who don't know, you, you know, he is a famous drag queen and porn director. And he has made decades of like some of the highest quality porn in the business. And he has a shop, and so he's moving in there, which is great. But this documentary is about. Uh, this is this straight couple that bought this bookstore that became, uh, you know, sort of the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the I want to say like the uh, Bur Bourbon Goodorf. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, corn. It is a sleazy bookstore on the corner of Santa Monica and Hayworth, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm wrong about that. But it's, and not only did it have all the porn print, and you know, videotape porn and books and things too. But it was a very eclectic. But had great Greek greeting cards with shirtless guys. But not only what happened in the store, which they'll tell you about the documentary. But I know from firsthand because it's in '82 is when the West Hollywood joined. I started coming to LA in '84, and it was the center of cruising. It was um, where gay men would come. There's the, 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 what's the bar next door to it? The, um, uh, um, yeah, uh, it's like an old, an old dive bar, very famous. The Gold Coast. The Gold, Gold Coast, Coast yeah. is next door. And behind the Gold, the Gold Coast is literally next door. Behind the Gold Coast is a public 
uh, Santa Monica city owned controlled strip of, of uh, metered parking. And that's called Vaseline Alley. Yes. Oh my what God. What's you can go you as, like, everyone's getting so excited. What, what is it called? Vaseline Alley. And why and is it called that? Because you can and go down. Everything for a minute. <laughs> you can go down, you, everyone just sat in their cars cruise, maybe pulled out some junk. Now this sounds very lewd, but let's just say, and the reason that book, uh, uh, circus of books is gone and this culture in that area is gone is because there's grinder. So now there's ways for people to hook up and have sex, whether, you know, Tinder for the straight people, grinder for the gay people, et cetera. And, but before there was no way of, you had to go out to find people who were also in the same mood you were in. And it just, you know, it's men on men. There's a lot of uh, sexual repression and guilt during this time. So it was, a, a place for exhibitionists and perverts and cowboys and and doctors and lawyers and professional people and, and and young television executives who went looking for a good time and 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 you could drive you could, you could loop it you could go down the alley behind the bar and then loop around and do the parking meters and do the thing and then pull in for his parking space and it was it, it even the streets around it for the like three or four blocks in that area to this day still have signs that you can't turn left after 10 p.m. because it was like a Rose Bowl parade every night, every, every, every night. Um, yeah, I also just want to say that the, one of the things about Circus of Butts is that yes, there was all of that going on, but they also, as you mentioned, had a very eclectic book offer, you know, yeah. book they were selling that had like, you know, lots of LGBTQ history and things like that. So you could actually go there and say, I'm just going for the books and like and be serious about that because that you could do that or you could go for the Vaseline Alley experience and back. Wasn't there a separate section? So there was the sort of legitimate bookstore in the front part yes and then, no. then you, you had to have your id to go into the back the, the documentary though is really great and i recommend anybody watching it on netflix uh executive produced by ryan murphy because um rachel's dad was worked as a special effects divisor on star trek which i feel is the earth text of our times you know star trek is like so much like modern life and, and so many brilliant things were invented on star trek and he was a special effects guy and he also invented some incredible thing to do with kidney dialysis machines i don't know that he actually invented dialysis itself but he's clearly a genius and rachel the director is is also a really yeah. smart, great. great it's Barry director. Mason and his wife is Karen, and their daughter, as you said, is, Rachel, is uh, directing it. And it's uh, it was a family business, and they, and they talk a lot in the documentary. I can tell from the, the you've seen it, but I just saw from the trailer. They had they led double lives because they were very respectable people, and what they were doing really was fighting for freedom of speech, especially after Reagan in the eighties when they were cracking down on pornography. And think about that world then, and what we are allowed to see and share and do now. So Absolutely. Um, it, it brings back memories of a time that I want to say I'm ashamed of, but I, they were, it was necessary. It's, no, it's no, you know, no shame involved. So because the books is now creaming on Netflix. <laughs> it will be shortly. You silly boy. <laughs> yeah, I think it's actually April 22nd, but yeah. soon enough. Okay, James, moving on. Number nine. Number nine. Uh, you know, the last week there were two big finales on TV that I sort of want to pay tribute to and talk to about uh, for a minute because uh, one of them was Modern Family, who after 11 seasons, I believe it was, is finally shuttering its doors. Um, and the other was Shit's Creek, which was something that has been around for six years and they, they put in and they stopped uh, filming. Um, Modern Family, I know... Tom, it's a show that you really, really love, and you've talked about it at, you know, um, ad nauseum <laughs> on our, here on our show. Um, How dare you? <laughs> um, you know, it. What what made it special for for us was that it had two gay characters, Cam and Mitchell, who um, had a very devoted and loving relationship, and they had adopted a girl, Lily. And the show was a throwback in a lot of ways to um, old family style sitcoms, but it was very modern and it was very it was very new at the time because it, it, it didn't have it ha didn't have the laugh track. It was sort of like uh, Office, The Office, things like that. And so it 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 changed TV a lot. But then in the last couple of years, it had started to sort of it it won a buttload of Emmys, but it, then it sort of um, other shows came along and usurped its place a little bit. And I, you know, tuned in a little bit this season, and I noticed that some of the writing had dropped off a little bit. I, 
I, I watched an episode that was very amateurish. It was I was really embarrassed for it. But the, but but the last two episodes I, I tuned in for, and it was just it was like it was the it, the first episode. It was you know it was really nice. It was good to see, and I really enjoyed it. And I and it's a sad thing for it to for it to be gone because it really was. It had it the end of an era. End of an era has its place in, in TV history. The other one though, Shit's Creek. I don't know if have you all been watching it. Have you are you all caught up on it? I'm not. I still have that to look forward to in life. Tom, I really think that it's going to be like an evergreen show for you for the rest of your life. The characters on it are so fresh and so funny. And that first season, you think, well, how can they keep going from here? What are they going to do? And they somehow keep reinventing the wheel and reinventing the wheel. And by the fourth and fifth season, literally, you love these characters so much. Every single one of them is a, is just gold. And they, w- once they introduce Patrick, David, the gay character, finds the love of its life. And literally, there's some seasons. I mean, there's some episodes on the fifth season where you were sobbing from the first, from the minute it starts to the end of it. Like, you cry from beginning to end. You are so in- happy for these characters. And by the end, by the last episode... Um, Everyone has sort of moved on a little bit and they've all gone off to find their in it. It's a perfect finale. It's a perfect ending. And you literally have grown to love these characters so much. If you haven't watched Shit's Creek, I'm telling you it is the best show on television and give it a shot. All right. I do. I do that work. is Modern yep. Family, which is on Hulu or ABC and Shit's Creek on Netflix or Hulu. Fenton, have you ever given it a, sh- have you given it a shot? I have actually. I'm sort of rationing myself with it though, because I I feel it's like a you can't binge it really. You have to like so much. No, but but I do think that that once you get past that first season, you will want to start binging because it right. just it 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 begins to to pick up the pace a little bit. Once the shit hits the fan. Ha. Ah. <laughs> um, uh, James, number eight. Number eight. I've just, just, you know, like the great thing about this COVID, it was not a great thing, but binging is up, right? Yeah. You know, and I've discovered a series. I I saw an ad the other day that said, I think it was a memo. I love Christine Baranski, right? And it was, oh yeah, Memo 618. And it was for a series called The Good Fight, which for some reason I have completely missed. But I, I go on to CBS All Access and I discover, like, this is the fourth season that they were advertising. So I started at the beginning. Um, it's Christine Baranski. Tom, have you talked about it before The Good Fight? I have. Well, now, wait a minute. Is this, did it start off as being part of The Good Wife or something and then it spun yeah. off from there? It's okay. sort of iterated out of that. And it's Christine Baranski is now starring as a love- lawyer of a law firm. And, and season one begins basically with a financial scandal in which her goddaughter's father has lost all her savings. And so she's kicked out of the, the firm of which she's a name partner and sets up, joins an African-American firm and is fighting her way back up from the bottom. It is so good. And she is so amazing. And I, I just, I'm so excited. I mean, I, 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 and funnily enough, I'm not going to talk about season one, which is where I'm sort of about halfway through season one, because what drew me to it was this 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 ad for season four, which is Memo 618. And, and without giving it away, I mean, how can I give it away? It's just written online. It's like Christine Baranski wakes up out of a coma, imagining a world in which Hillary Clinton won the election. Mm-hmm. It just sounds so brilliant. It sounds so brilliant. I almost want to like completely skip ahead. But what I'm loving about this, being even on part one of the, even the first half of season one, is it perhaps it's the only TV drama series that really grapples with the Trump era and full on and head on and unapologetically. And you feel that everything else in scripted is sort of just stepping to the side and, and somewhat not ignoring it, but just not really getting to grips with that rage and anger and incomprehension that I feel and imagine other people feel that we have this batshit crazy president, evil well. President. It's interesting, too, in that it's on CBS, which is a bastion for older people who are mostly, you know, sort of Fox watchers and things like that. No, no, no. But but it's a, CBS is traditionally a very conservative network. Yeah. And so the fact that it's on there and it deals with Trump is is a, a step in the right direction, I think. And it's sort of showing older people uh, another side that maybe they wouldn't be uh, shown otherwise. 
It's the same. It's 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 the brainchild of Robert and Michelle King, who also created The Good Wife. And you know, I think um, I don't know too much inside scoop. I only watched it because it's on the CBS app, which I don't subscribe to. But I watched it because there was a time this summer when they were airing the first season for free because I'm a cheapskate on Sunday, so I was watching it then. But it's really it's quite something. And our good friend, who we're going to be talking about in the next block, John Tolins has written on uh, the last two seasons. Oh, well, no wonder it's so brilliant. Because I also, you know, I want to say that I had just, one of the things that I've been streaming and I've been um, binge watching is Sybil, the old 90s show with Sybil Shepherd and Christine Baranski. So I, I'm, I'm doing a little Christine Baranski too. Well, she is just so amazing. Amazing. I, I've always confused her with someone else's, net, like that, uh, who's that Broadway uh, singer who's amazing? Kristen uh, Chenoweth? Thank you. So, <laughs> I'm just so excited to have found Christine Baranski in The Good Fight, and I'm absolutely loving it. And what I'm so excited about this four seasons, you know. Yes. It's going to be a lot of I also love the cast and the and even the incidental casting because they it's 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 um it, it's uh, excuse me Robert and Michelle's taste but they they hire the most eclectic New York Broadway kind of actors you know uh, uh, even um, Bernadette Peters has a a big role in it it's, it's fabulous to watch and it feels without losing its touch with reality it feels almost like this this new season feels a bit like sort of the black mirror of the dystopian time in which we yeah. find ourselves living so i just i really cannot wait to to get to have you tom i think you should read you should just pay for your cbs all access subscription all right, all right. Be, you know you guys we got to pay subscriptions for for that's the future of streaming you know there's a little uh, uh, network called um what is it called wow presents plus <laughs> but you know i'll tell you something though i i don't know that i have ten dollars here ten dollars there ten dollars here to keep subscribing to all these things it's it, it's starting to add up where yeah. i'm starting to spend a hundred two hundred dollars an extra a month on the, I heard the cable oh. guy who you could give a 22 and he'd go to the roof and give you the free cable. Remember that guy? I missed that. Yeah, well, you've cut your cable, right, James? You don't pay No, no, cable. my cable is like $170 a month. So cut the cable and then do some, some, some curate your own subscriptions. I guess I'm going to have to Roku and, and everything. I don't, I, I don't know what it, it seems to me that, that it, things are getting more and more expensive, and I don't know that uh, the, the poor people of the world can afford this new world we live in. Well, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, YouTube also uh, does quite a good uh, fa uh, package too, where you can get regular TV. I don't know the details anyway. Okay, um, why don't we take a quick break? Uh, Blake, you got a question for us? I do have a question. Um, the Modern Family, or not the Modern Family, Modern Family, which James spoke of, was the first ABC series to win an Emmy for ABC and the outstanding comedy in 22 years. What was the last one in 1988? I think I know. Hmm. You're listening to the Wire Report on Radio Andy, and we'll have the answer right after the break. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report, things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton Bailey, co-founder of World of Wonder, here with Tom Campbell, our chief creative officer, and James St. James, legendary editor of the Wow Report, and of course, Blake Jacobs, who asked us a very, what's the word? Teasing question. <laughs> we were talking about Modern Family, which just ended, and um, that series won ABC the Emmy for Outstanding Comedy Series for the first time in 22 years. What was the last ABC series to win Outstanding Comedy Series in the year 1988? Tom, I'm gonna guess. I think it was the amazing, the impeccable, the now soiled by controversy sitcom, Roseanne. Oh, I'm gonna say Bill Cosby, which is oh. also soiled. NBC. Oh, I'm gonna say oh, okay. Murphy Brown because I, I don't know. PBS. Okay. <laughs> What's that one about the kid who grew up in the 60s? Wonder Years. A Wonder, Wonder Years. Year. That's it. Okay, oh, there you go. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, nice job, James. So we're counting down our top 10 things that made us go well. Before we carry on with the countdown at number seven, I will just say tonight, RuPaul's Drag Race, VH1, 8 p.m. Uh, it's uh, And you can get the Madonna Rusical, which I think, Tom, I have to say, is a 
high water mark of of drag in drag race history. I got to say both both yeah. the Fosse episode and the Madonna one have been really just unbelievable. I've been really impressed. Really epic moments of television that mm -hmm. generations will look back on and wonder how they did it. <laughs> it's an amazing season and the queens are amazing. We are eliminating queens that would normally be top three. And it's it's not pretty, but it, it is it makes for great television and great really lots of entertainment. And I, I don't want to make you blush, but you are amazing. So thank you. What what's that on either side of you right there? Are you going to have a third well, one? I, I didn't. I, I, I just, I'm what? Not, I'm doing, I'm doing a Those of you on the radio, I, I've been doing a lot of video conference calls from this very position. We're still working, and if I don't feel like the buyers are believing me, I pull out our <laughs> two of the uh, uh, you know, Thanks yeah. to the world of wonder for RuPaul's Drag Race. These remote meetings are quite good in that respect because at least you don't have to put the Emmys in the car and carry them through security. You can just them off the bunch exactly. and them in front of the camera. Or, 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 or I'll just go, I'll be waiting for someone to come on and I'll just be pretending I'm. <laughs> oh, no, oh yes, let's start. Let's start. Is it helping your pitches go better? Um, just, we might have got a good bite today, so I don't know. It might be helping. Okay, let's carry on with the countdown. Number seven. Number seven. This is a viewer alert. Um, so many people, you know, in addition to binging and stuff, there's a lot of people doing special events uh, because we're all, A, everyone's available. <laughs> we know where to get everybody. They're at home. And there was an event that had already been set up. It was going to be a one night only restaging of an amazing play that we've seen and talked about before, Buyer and Seller. Seller spelled C-E-L-L-A-R as a basement. It's written by Jonathan Toland and the actor Michael Urey played it forever in New York and in LA and it continues to tour. It's a very, it's a one man show, but it is for those who don't remember, or if you've heard of this, because most people have heard of the show and they didn't see it. This is your chance to see it online on Sunday, the Sunday at 8 PM on YouTube channel of Broadway.com. And buyer seller, my friend John Tolens, who writes uh, on the, the Good Fight, he and I have been friends since college, and he is just the most clever guy and does all kinds of things. But he had that big Barbara Streisand, my passion for design book that she put out. I don't know now, ten years, and it's all about her impeccable taste and her impeccable remodeling of this of this compound of houses and farms and water mills and streams that she has in the Malibu Mountains. In it, just a detail in it is about um, the basement of her barn. Uh, she has turned into a like a cobblestone street of little shops, S-O-H-S-H-O-P-P-E-S, -S -S -P -P -E and where she houses her, her doll collection, her costume collection, her so I don't know. Well, that detail alone just blows the mind. And my genius friend, John Tolan, thought, I wonder if, like, does anybody work down there when she goes down? So he created a fictional character, a gay guy played by Michael Yuri, who's just been fired by Disney and is looking, is desperate for a job, gets like hooked up, doesn't know what it is, and ends up having an interview with Barbara Streisand and ends up sitting in her basement and waiting for her to come downstairs. And I think Michael plays a total of five or six characters and it flashes from him being, and, and you know, it, it's there's no sets. It's just like a chair, and, and but he talks to his boyfriend. It's about gay relationships. It's about stardom. It's about wanting to be something you can't be. It's about it's all these things. And uh, they were presented one night. Now Michael Yuri will be performing it online on Sunday at 8 p.m. on Broadway.com YouTube channel from his living room. And it's perfect. Perfect. It's, it's, it's the funniest show I think I've seen in years. We all saw it together. You you dragged us all one day to go see it at the Amundsen or something. I can't yeah, remember. I think LA, yep. Yeah, and it was the most fun I've had in the theater in years. It, he mm -hmm. Michael Yuri is hysterical. The writing is so crisp and so funny and so brilliant. And if you if you haven't seen it, it's just the funniest show you'll ever see. It absolutely yeah. is, and for uh, for a few years we tried to make a, a film version of it, and it was just it never it never worked out, which is a, a shame. But this is a spectacular, unique. It is a masterpiece. I, and you know what, Tom? I do believe it will get made into a movie one day because it's it's just too good to um, yeah to change. And, and if you're a Barbara Streisand fan, it does not offend. Yeah, it's it, 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 it has the most respect. It's it's hilarious. And it's it's not it, it does you know it's it's gloves off but it's not mean it's 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 full of love and light and and hilarity 
Um, and it is a benefit for uh, Broadway Cares, Equity Fights, AIDS, COVID-19, Emergency Assistance Fund, because don't we all need to help each other right now? That's great. Let's go on to number six, James. Number six. Well, you know, everybody has hunkered down in their homes and uh, people have sort of figured out, are trying to figure out ways, as we are ourselves, to keep the show going. And Saturday Night Live is no exception. They um, it had an episode this last week in which all the char- all the actors were at home and they did remotes and they did remote skits and they did what they could do. And it ended up being one of the most watched episodes in the last 10 years, I believe. I know that it was the number two from this year. This season, um, Eddie Murphy, his his comeback was the number one for the, this year. But some of the sh- some of the as as Saturday Night Live, as always with Saturday Night Live, some things worked and some things fell like a, a thud. Um, they, uh, um, I know that uh, there was a, interesting because we got to see inside everybody's homes, and that's one of the things that <laughs> I'm really enjoying about this this new wave of of TV is that we're seeing the inside of everyone's homes. I don't know, like. Anderson Cooper, I'm loving seeing his remote. Um, uh, I noticed Andrea Mitchell the other day on CNN. I was trying to notice what everyone's books are. And she has a, a, a photo book of Patty Hansen nudes. And I was like, that sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, uh, uh, I noticed, um, let me see, uh, Tom Hanks was the host. And he hosted from his house. Yeah, did you? My well, is that- Tom Hanks is he came from his kitchen. Yeah. I, don't think that, I think that was the kitchen of his guest house or his pool house or well, some, the office on the estate. It, some people it, say it was probably his secondary or third kitchen yeah. in, in the house. It was fantastic. Uh-huh. But I don't believe that's his kitchen. I think it's- Exactly, not, exactly. I um, I, uh, uh, Alec Baldwin returned and he did a, a, tr- a Trump thing. There was um, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Kate McKinnon did a, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and everybody tried to do skits with just one person, you know. And so that that sort of ha- hampered what they were doing. Um, I loved seeing Pete Davidson because we all know he lives in the basement of his mother's house, and so we got to see that. I was just I was fascinated because of all of that, and I thought that it ended up being really funny, and I ended up really enjoying it. Tom, what did you think? I think I totally agree. I give. I think everyone has license to make mistakes right now mm-hmm. and to try. And I think you're, you're, you're interested in all the things we're talking about, seeing them try. When they do land something, it's funny. It's a rich laugh. When they're trying, you appreciate the effort. But I am obsessed, and I'm obsessed a little bit with the Hanks because Rita Wilson was on CBS this morning talking about being, you know, uh, COVID's first patient. And, and everyone, especially really rich people, are trying so hard because, like, Jennifer Lopez got busted online for showing her how, you know, like, they, they were all in the backyard, like, having too much fun. So uh, Rita, for the CBS thing, the other Hanks, she had the wall, but it looked like that stone they use at um, at the Getty Museum. Like, very expensive. I don't even know the name of it. But everyone's just trying so hard, like, oh, I, I'm nothing, nothing going on here. You know, there's not an indoor pool in our living room. Don't worry about it. I did want to. No, oh, I just want to say permanent it, change. Like, do you think this once this all ends and we get back to normal? Do you think the, the? How do you think this legacy of this will continue in terms of broadcasting and celebrities being accessible and things like that? Well, I do want to say that a really bad timing thing that just happened was I don't know if you guys noticed Architectural Digest came out with an issue and it had Drake featured on on the Drake's new. $150 million mansion that he just bought and it was he just spent like 300 you know like 100 million or something decorating it and it was the most vulgar tone deaf thing that you have it could not have been a worse time for something like this to come out because it he was lambasted just raked over the coals for yeah. being so tone deaf for showing this 150 million dollar mansion at a time right now when that is not the thing that people want to see i've always found that kind of look at my house stuff vulgar oh it is just awful and it, it literally, the art and everything in this, it looks like somebody, it looks like Beverly Hillbillies just got their first hundred million and decided to, to spend it all on a chandelier. And it's just like, oh, I don't know the answer to your question, Fenton. What's the what's the takeaway? But I think this gap between rich and poor, which already exists, is going to be even vaster. And I think people are going to have to. I think people are going to start down. realizing they that people are going to start realizing that they have to start hiding it because the, the, we're going to be headed towards the guillotines if you keep showing it to the poor people. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's good. Good takeaway. 
Um, number five. Number five. I, uh, you know, Billy has been showing Nolan films every evening we've been doing film. And um, I guess it was sort of appropriate, really, to watch a couple of zombie films. Sure. Um, because you know, you've got A to Z and you're to zombies now. Well, so COVID is a sort of, you know, it's a, it, the virus is like a zombie thing, isn't it? Um, I mean, I suppose it's different because you don't go ripping people's flesh out and eating it. Yeah, I'm about to start ripping a few people's flesh out. <laughs> but that idea of us all being locked down from an invisible enemy. Anyway, um, so, so we watched uh, Train to Busan. Have you ever seen Train to Busan? No. It's a South Korean film um, made in uh, 2016, um, and it's about a zombie outbreak on a train, on a high-speed train. I tell you, this film is so gripping, and it sort of, I, I, I feel in some ways it prefigures um, Parasite. You know, it's got these themes of class war. And it sounds sort of, a little bit like Snowpiercer. I suppose so. I suppose it does, except, except that, you know, when you think about zombies, you normally think, yes, okay, so, you know, they used to be slow and lumbering, and then in, what, 2002, I think, 28 days later, sort of accelerated the zombies. But then when you have a zombie outbreak of fast-moving zombies on a high-speed train, it's like a wig on a wig. It's like, um, and this this whole, this film is just so great. And I, I, I think it's always, I know it seems sacrilege. I think in some ways it's better than Parasite and it's very similar to Parasite but uh -huh. in terms of these sort of thematic elements. But it's this nonstop grip your heart action film. And then the other film we watched, a sort of double bill, is uh, Shaun of the Dead, which is a very different take on zombies, but uh, because it's primarily a comedy. But I just found it was very um, fetching. I don't know if I'm going to watch any more zombie films, but it was certainly... What year was Shaun of the Dead? I can't remember. Shaun of the Dead, um, let's see. I think it, it was 2004. It was 2004. Because I was, I was trying to figure out when zombies first went fast. And that was definitely 28 Days Later, which was 2002. And a number of people, like the Shaun of the Dead guy, Edgar Wright, and they didn't really approve of this, of these accelerated zombies, because they used to argue that if you're dead, it's a disability, not a superpower. Mm. But I think fast zombies are kind of good. I don't know. Do you like zombies, James? Do they move you? Um, yes. No. I. Um. You know. I think you probably should have started with Dawn of the Dead and then done your Day of the Dead too, which are two of your favorites. Yeah. Maybe we should do this segment again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've been, I've been wanting to pitch a show on Wild Presents Plus where I, uh, from remote from from home, I introduce to you. Uh, Sunset Boulevard, whatever happened to Baby Jane, and I make you and Nolan watch it, and Blake watch it because he's never seen it before too. And then I do a little intro and tell the backstory. You guys watch it, and then we all discuss it. I, I would love. I've been it's on my list to get Nolan to watch Sunset Boulevard, but every now and then, you know, every time he sit down to watch a movie, there's like. But but I'm going to be the one to introduce it to you. Tom and I will introduce it and talk a little bit about it. Then you watch it, and we watch you watching it, and then Nolan tells us what he thinks. Oh, that's okay. I love that. Cool. Okay, yeah, let's take a break. I like it. Uh, let's take a break. Break. Have you got a question for us? I do. This one's kind of funny. Um, what celebrity revealed this week that they had officially changed their child's name? After realizing the child's birth name sounded like genital. I saw this. Yeah, this is hysterical. Mm -hmm. Genital. Genital, come in. Dinner time, genital. <laughs> You're listening to the Wow Report on Radio Andy. We'll be right back with the answer after the break. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Tom and James. And Blake, you asked us a question about talking to the genitals or something. What? <laughs> yes. What celebrity revealed this week that they had officially changed their child's name after realizing their their birth, the child's birth name that they gave them, actually sounds like the word genital. 
Well, I'm just before I'm before I give it open to let them guess. the The name of the baby is Jean G E N E, and then the middle name is Attel A T T E L Jean Attel. And when they realize Jean Attel, Jean Attel, then it sounds like Genital. So, who do you think the celebrity was who named their child Jean Attel? I have no idea. I'm just, only because I know she has a baby. I'm gonna say Amy Schumer. That's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My kid's middle name is Attel. Because of Dave Attell, both a good f- friend oh, of right. the parents, they sw- They changed the name to Gene David, Gene David Fisher. Yeah, Gene David Fisher. How do you make that kind of mistake? I mean... I- she says it was her mom who was the one that was like, you realize that this, your son's name is genital, right? Well, remember, I, I came to you and you said you were going to name uh, Nolan Nolan. And I said, oh, my God, you can't name a child Nolan because all he's going to hear is the no part of Nolan. And he's going to as- associate his name with no, no, Nolan, no, no. And I was so worried that he was going to be traumatized by that name. You guys, you know, my name is Thomas Christopher, but it's actually my parents changed it after my um, my baptism because the first name is Harry Balls. And they realized that that was... <laughs> Might be misinterpreted. Here. One more time. What is their first name? <laughs> Thank you, Blake. <laughs> I, I tell you, I get, I get rewarded. I am a fair. I like this. <laughs> 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 it was a <laughs> <mistake. laughs> it's some sort of awful, unfunny Saturday Night Live experience. <laughs> the punk that I was talking about. <laughs> I, I enjoy it. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm having a hot flush here. Okay, let's carry on with the countdown. We've reached number four. Number four. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. It took me a second, and now we're lucky enough to be working with her. But Laura Bernante, who is five times nominated Broadway actress, incredible singer, has an album out right now. Um, you should. We, it's, it's on the Wow Report. It's a, she has a single off of it which is the Jonas Brothers song. What is it, James? It's, I'm uh, out for you. Thank you. She um, is also, a lot of people know her who don't know Broadway. She is on, when, when Stephen Colbert has Melania Trump on, she is the actress playing Melania Trump. So she's beautiful, long brown hair. Her eyes are much more wide open than they appear on Stephen Colbert's show. But she um, was on her way, like a month ago or less, was on her way to Chicago to shoot a pilot. And guess what? They weren't shooting the pilot. So she had to cover. So she has a brand new baby and her husband, and they moved with uh, their, their New Yorkers, but they went to New Jersey to be with her mom. Her mom is a longtime singing teacher for a lot of young people. And the mom is just saying how devastated all of her students are because every spring musical has been canceled. So, you know, and you know, it's corny, but you know, this generation is ident- one of their biggest identifiers is anxiety. They're going through this. I mean, that seems like a big deal to us, but these are those weird kids who, whose only time to really shine in high school sometimes is in their musical productions and it's being denied them. So Laura, with her big heart, just created the hashtag, hashtag sunshine songs. And she thought she, and she said, I will listen, you know, sing, perform your song. I will listen. I'll get back to you. Well, it's like 6,000 strong right now. Wow. And she also has another one called hashtag sunshine songs grad for college students who are from the you know, schools of performance art. And they, they always end with like big performances for, uh, you know, uh, for shows like showcases and things. And supposedly one of the hashtag sunshine songs grad seniors got hired off of uh, this, this social media experiment. So, yeah, sorry. Can you explain? Like, I don't. I'm not following completely. Like, so the songs are people performing that song. Yeah, it's like I was supposed to be Tevye and fill the roof. So I'm gonna sing if I were a rich man. Yeah, I go to go there, and it's on Instagram. It's on Twitter, and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are watching, and it's just a great way to fight what's going on. You know, it's it's like with 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 positivity and opportunity. And um, we are at World of Wonder trying right now to figure out if, is there, if there's a bigger play, if there's something uh, something we can do that might uh, see the light of day on another platform. But um, I just, hats off to Laura Bernante, who's beautiful, talented, more people should know who she is if you don't. Um, uh, and, and you can go to the WOW Report uh, to, or, or just go to YouTube to hear her 
her uh, version, which features some of the kids she's she's met because uh, so she has relationships with them. And and it's just sweet. It's people that, you know, there's also stories of like um, uh, uh, extra capable, differently capable people who may not be able to perform on the stage without being, but, you know, in this medium uh, mm -hmm. are just beaming with joy and love and talent. So uh, just, you know, what's that thing Mr. Rogers said when, when bad things happen, look for the helpers, look for the helpers. Laura Bernante is a, a helper. That's fantastic. No, uh, James, number three. Number three. Well, you know, I'm slowly making my way through every movie that's ever been produced and ever written, too. And I find myself going through genres. And, um, you know, I went through a, a big silent movie phase a few years ago in which I must have watched, like, every silent movie ever made. I went through a pirate phase, like, movies that I never really watched when I was growing up because I didn't really care about pirates. I did a whole bunch of pirate movies from the 40s and 50s. And now I found myself falling into um, some black exploitation movies, which uh -huh. is something that I had never really watched when I was growing up. It, it, was, it didn't really speak to me at the time. So now I watched something called Black Mama, White Mama. Mama, starring Pam Greer, Ooh. and it she Pam Greer, who is just beautiful and so fabulous and so wonderful. Um, uh, it's it's this she's a prostitute who was arrested in the Philippines, and the movie is filmed in the Philippines in 1973. <laughs> And she is in a, in a, a woman's prison and there's lesbianism and, and mean uh, wardens and everything. And she ends up being there. She's being transferred to another prison and she's chained to another woman in the bus. And the bus is attacked by guerrilla leftist rebels. And they, so they, they shoot everybody up and they escape. And so they're chained to each other going through the, the jungle of the Philippines, being chased by warlords and criminals and uh, the police and everything. And they're cat fighting with each other and beating the crap out of each other and it's fascinating to me because i you know they're stumbling and stabbing each other and they're they're dressing as nuns and trying to you know they're they're, they're doing all it's just it's very fun but um they're trying to get to safety and i had never seen many black exploitation musicals or movies and i don't really have a lot of context for it but i imagine that at the time See, for black women, especially, it probably would have been very empowering to see a beautiful, kick-ass woman like Pam Greer being the star of her own movie. I imagine for African American just society in general to have their own action American heroes for the first time, it was probably a really it was a big step forward. And even though the characters are very one-dimensional and the writing is very well, actually the, it was written by Jonathan Demi who went on to do Silence of the Lambs in Philadelphia and everything. This was the first movie he ever did, and he was the writer. So there's a lot of really fun, smart things that are happening in it. Mm -hmm. um, I just, it, it's it's a sort of an inch, and it, I don't know that it holds up, but there's a lot of, you're a jive-ass turkey motherfucker. Like a lot of the dialogue is like that, but um, it's very fun and I don't know if it holds up in, in the modern era, but I imagine at the time it was it was really a, an important step. Like forward. Said, it's, it's a genre. It's as legitimate as film noir. You know, it's a genre yeah. and things get made for commercial reasons and lots of crass reasons. But it was at least a stepping stone. Right. Yeah. For, and like for, I said, for, Pam Greer is magnetic and charismatic and beautiful and, and kick ass. And the, the script is by Jonathan Demme. And it's, it's interesting to go back. Black mama, white mama. Which, which is kind of the black exploitation version of the defiant ones. Right. Sort of. so yeah, I imagine that's how it was pitched. Yeah. Tony Curtis and Cindy Potier. There are handcuffed uh -huh. the white guy, a black guy. But Pam Greer has a big body of work, right? She's yeah, like well, she did, you know, t um, Jackie Brown with t Quentin Tarantino. She'd also done Coffee and what was some of the other in the 70s. Um, she was, it, she, was she in Superfly? I don't remember. Yeah, but she also had the Renaissance. Oh, isn't she on the L Word? Am I wrong on Showtime? Oh, no, possibly. She's had a whole career, that, you know. Uh, and uh, still uh, just as beautiful as she's ever been. Absolutely. She, she's in one of my favorite movies of all time, Jawbreaker. Oh, right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh. Well, that's Black Mama, White Mama. It's on the iTunes store and also Amazon Prime. Number two. Well, James, I've been, I guess I've been going down a zombie, a zombie hole. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> there's a new movie coming out. Um, it's called 5G Zombies. And I thought, what is this 5G Zombies? So I watched the trailer. 
Tell it it's terrible, but don't let that stop you. I'll we'll put the link <laughs> on, on the wire report. But it's interesting because the, the I was like, why would you call a, what is 5G zombies? And I started Googling, and basically there's this whole conspiracy theory that 5G, which is the new super fast wireless iteration for your iPhone and, and mobile device. Oh, it's going to bring about the end of the world is what it's going to do. Yeah. It's going to bring about the end in, uh, computers and the, the, the um, simulation is going to happen. Well, the, the, the conspiracy theorists, James, are saying that, that something about the frequency of 5G is making people susceptible to coronavirus, uh, okay. and, which sounds kind of ridiculous and crazy because I actually just went deep enough into this story to there's gamma rays, right? And then you have X-rays, and then you have visible light. So we're descending the wave spectrum. You have gamma rays, and they're the widest waves, and they get faster and faster and faster. Then you have visible light. Below visible light, you have infrared, and below that, radio waves. And so 5G is in the radio wave spectrum. So the idea, point being, the idea scientifically that these radio waves are doing anything different to us than any other radio waves have done before makes no sense. It's bonkers. But this conspiracy theory has, has seems to have taken real root. And in the UK, where they're just rolling out 5G and installing all the masks for it, People have been burning them down, assaulting the workers, uh, burning the mass, destroying the equipment. It's crazy. I, I think like something like 30 acts of arson and vandalism this month alone in April. I, if people believe this shit. People are nuts. Well, we, we friends, and you and I have a friend who is very, very much into this, and I'm not going to say his name, but somebody who will sit there and talk to you for hours and hours and hours about how it's going to bring about the death of, of civilization. But Fenton, going back to your question at the, the last segment, which is like, how, how are you, get, what are the long-term ramifications of this pandemic and our, and our economy and all that? I worry, I mean, uh, conspiracy theories flourish all the time for weird, bizarre reasons. And I always wonder if it has something to do with mental health. <laughs> I, I, I don't have an answer. But I do think when people are desperate and the world is not going their way, it opens up people to look for a boogeyman, to look for something to fight against, which is the zombie in, you know, sort of this mythic terms. And uh, it's concerning. I think it's concerning that, that, that it's, it gets to this level. And I, I, you hope we come out of this worldwide depression, recession, whatever it is, and, and it's full with hope and not so much desperation and, yeah. Well, absolutely, yeah. Tom. And I, I think there's always, there's so often parallels between a, a physical sickness, and they may just be coincidental or just merely parallel events, but there is a there is a viral-like element to fear itself and the way that it will spread. And the, um, the there's no question that, that at, at sort of times like this, conspiracy theories do sort of flourish and thrive. And what I think is, is disturbing is that some of our leaders, whether it's a, Bolsonaro in Brazil or Trump here in America, they are themselves amplifying these conspiracies, these sort of yeah. fear-based crazy theories. So back to, my, back to my connection to mental illness. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Exactly. You put it so much better. And, um, but I was just very surprised to learn all about that. And that actually digging a little deeper, you know, you wonder, well, where does this come from? The it appears that the source of the 5G conspiracy theory is Russia yeah. and RT, because Russia isn't ready to roll out 5G, so they basically want to sabotage the West's technological advantage and, and Asia's technological advantage by sowing fear and making people think that it's going to be uh, the end of the world. Anyway, enough of that. Um, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll reveal the number one thing this week that made us go wow. Yay. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back. You're listening to the Wow Report on Radio Andy. I'm Fenton. Here with Tom and James and Blake. We're all in our continuing this remote thing. Um, guys, what's the number one thing that made us go wow this week? Number one. I thought we should do a little plug. We are, this is something that World of Wonder is sponsoring. Um, and it's being thrown in its Stonewall Gives Back. And it is a benefit that is going to be airing on WOW Presents 
are, are for free on our YouTube channel. It is a benefit to raise money in conjunction with the Stonewall Foundation, the famous bar where the gay revolution started in New York. Um, and we're raising funds, uh, and I'll tell you in a minute who's gonna be performing, but raising funds that will be uh, taken by the Stonewall uh, Foundation and then people will sort of write in for grants, but for nightlife workers, bartenders, waiters, the, the, you know, James, the people that you know very well from your past, the people who make a living in that way, because they, like all of us, are in a position where everything is closed down and there's no, no sign of, of it coming together. So um, uh, uh, this is being um, uh, the, uh, Eric Bergen, who uh, did, uh, is behind the brilliant Rosie O'Donnell, uh, first out of the gate, uh, fun, you know, fundraiser that she did. He uh, was de dealing with Leland or Brett McLaughlin, our good friend, and does a lot of the music for RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, and they're calling on their friends in the community. And Troy Savon is scheduled, Muna, Grace and Chance, Ali X, Rufus Wainwright, Our Lady J, the fabulous Todd Hall, John Cameron Mitchell, and others are still being um, are being asked to participate. But it's going to be uh, it's going to be next Thursday night, which is I want to say April twenty third. We're going to check at eight p.m. We're going to double check that. Um, but it's it's um, I, again it's it, it's just amazing to see people not only just oh we should do something but get on the phone make it happen. It feels like uh, uh, artists of all different from all different areas are. Uh, more uh, willing than ever to throw in their hat and to do something. And we'll be able to look at their backgrounds and look at their houses and judge them. So really, that's the reason, if nothing else, we should watch. Has anyone called Brittany yet? Um, we, we, you know, we call Brittany every day. <laughs> I just hung up with her before this. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to let people know about that. I know there's a lot of things out there and you can just listen and have fun too. You don't have to give, but it's, it's uh, I, you know, are there too many of these? I don't think so. I think this is a, this is a this is a monument. Well, this is something no one's ever lived through, and we're living through it. And uh, again, I'm a I'm a sucker, but when people step up and do something good with it, I'm all for a, uh, you know, shooting their horn. Honk, James. Yes, <laughs> you're still with us, but I got you know, number one. one. You're welcome to have your own number one. I no, totally that, was kind. That, was, that was lovely. Thank you. No, absolutely. No, I totally agree with you. I, I still can't stop thinking about this idea, though, of, of what happens when we can get together again. How much residual, how much of this remoteness? Was I, I don't ever see a time where I will not be wearing a mask. I cannot foresee getting on a bus, going to a club. I don't know how any, going to a movie theater. I don't know how any of it is going to, I don't see six months from now, I'm going to be going out and feeling comfortable in crowds. I think that's because the, the fear is going to linger after yeah. the virus itself. But I do imagine it will go away and that we'll get back to. Well, but we know that there's a second wave coming probably in, in um, October or November. So I was just thinking about this. My grandmother is almost 93, but she was born in like 27 or 28. And she was always adamant, like, go wash your hands before dinner, you know, go wash your hands. And I wondered, maybe she learned that because her parents had lived through the flu epidemic in 2020. Well, but by the same token, I remember my mother would always say, go outside and play in the mud because she wanted us to build up oh, our yeah. immunity to things. And she'd say, you know, don't come in. And, you know, and if we got sick, she'd or if someone in the neighborhood got sick, she'd say, go hang out with them so that we would get sick and we would build up our immunities. But your mom also yeah, but Chicken your mom. Bodies. When I was growing up, oh. if someone, a kid had chicken box, we'd all get together. And I still, I would yell at my mother till till the day she died. I was so furious with her that mm -hmm. her she was dating a guy who and his kid had chicken pox, and she made me take the day off from school and go spend the day with him so that I would get chicken pox. I was furious. Did you? Yes, I did. I got chicken, but my mother was also a nurse, and she knew about those things, and she knew that that that's how you build, you know, children build build up immunity. Go play in the dirt, she'd say. That's always what I always had to go do. But your mom wouldn't let you eat in the car. Well, but that's just because she that dinner time. I told you, I would tell you how she had a, a timer, and when we sat down to the dinner table, she would set it for forty five minutes, so that we had to spend forty five minutes at the dinner table talking to one another about what we did that day. And if you finished after five minutes, you still had to sit there for another 40, 40 minutes. 
It sounds like pure torture. It sounds like the wow report. <laughs> it sounds like the show, but the good news is, James, you're